I love talking about asynchronous remote work. Then we're going to be best friends, to be completely honest with you. Totally where, where I've come from. But let's start with, tell me how you started looking at remote work. So about five years ago, I have a couple companies, timedoctor.com and staff.com, which are both remote time tracking tools. And we've been running those businesses for about 12 years. And five years ago, we ended up having our company team retreat. So remote first teams generally, we fly into one location every single year. That year, we were going to Boracay, which is the party island in the Philippines. If you've never been there, highly suggest that you go. It's fantastic. We had about 100 people there. And we started asking ourselves, how do we get to 500 people or 1,000 people or 2,000 or 10,000 people remotely? So we started Googling stuff and nothing really came up. There was a whole bunch of information on how to be a digital nomad, which there's tons of conferences on that subject. And then there was a lot of information on how to hire a virtual assistant, but there was nothing on building and scaling a real remote first company. Remote first companies like Shopify now and Coinbase and GitLab, these multi-billion dollar deca unicorns that have really popped up over the last couple of years. So we said to ourselves, let's actually just run a conference on this. And so it was a ready, fire, aim philosophy. I don't know if you know the Pareto principle, but the work that you have to do usually expands into the time that you give it. So we said, okay, I'm going to book a venue in six months. We got about 250 people to that first conference, and then we built up to about 1,000 people three years later uh, with the conference. So we've been focusing entirely on <clears throat> building and scaling remote teams and teaching people the strategies to be able to execute on that. Got it. That makes sense. Now, I'm a data nerd, and I always am talking about research reports and data. And the one thing that in your discussions with me beforehand, you, know, you quoted that on average, the most successful remote companies you've researched collaborate less than their in-office counterparts. Now, my instinct is to go, well, that sounds bad. Uh, what does that mean, though? What does that actually mean in practice? So when I say less, it is also operative. The operative word is, what's the definition of collaboration to you? <clears throat> so I'll give you a real-world example. The people, the person that connected us for this call is Vaishali. And she's listening to this right now. Hi, hi, Shelly. Uh, how are you? She has worked with me for six years, day in, day out, every single day. And we have met in person or on Zoom five times during that six year uh, interaction that we've had. So she does and we do what you had already mentioned before, which I'm calling asynchronous management. And that's the one difference that all of the remote first companies that were remote before the pandemic had in common in comparison to what I lovingly call the pandemic panickers that went kind of like remote at gunpoint, right? They had no choice. They had to do it very quickly. And they unfortunately turned working from home into living at work. So I don't know about probably your listeners or the people watching this video. The vast majority of remote work today for people that are pandemic panickers are eight hour Zoom calls. We actually don't meet on Zoom at all. Uh, we maybe meet once a month on Zoom. The vast majority of our interactions are asynchronous, meaning there is no dependence upon immediacy inside of our organization, meaning there's no one that says we need to jump onto a call right now in order to be able to do something. Now, obviously that does happen from time to time. There are always emergencies, but fundamentally the organization is designed in a way to be able to make sure that everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing. And there are systems and processes and project management systems in place so that the platform actually becomes the manager and not necessarily the managers inside of the organization. Got it. Now you've brought up managers and that's where it's okay, interesting. Your research also says that remote first companies have on average half as many managers as the on-prem ones. Management in a remote first organization that is, is sort of redundant. So what structures work? How are people building their management style and reporting structures in these remote first companies? Well, first off, I think that's probably one of the major reasons why a lot of people are trying to get back to the office is because the managers know deep down inside that they are fundamentally redundant inside of this process. When you really look at what a manager does, generally about half of their workday is saying, hey, Dave, 
here are my metrics. And then Dave takes my metrics to his boss. And then his boss takes my metrics to the big boss. And that's how that company operates. It's kind of like a massive game of telephone where you're talking about the nuts and bolts of the business. Inside of remote first organizations, we have a concept that we call radical transparency. So everyone should theoretically have the same informational advantage as the CEO of the company. And all of that information should be on average documented automatically inside of the organization. So a lot of the times my metrics that I'm responsible for, the amount of leads that I get to the website, uh, the amount of traffic that I get to the website, all those types of things, that's actually automatically presented. So I don't have to manually report that to anybody. It's just on our dashboards. And then everyone in the organization has access to that information. So not only could my manager or my direct reports look at that information, but anyone in the company could look at that information. And this creates a really interesting opportunity for people to say, hey, I'm in customer support right now and I know nothing about marketing, but I'm actually looking at these things in marketing and it's really interesting because it's correlating to what's happening in customer support. And that's the part of this business that just continuously produces less and less need for the managers to effectively pay attention to the bureaucracy of remote work and focus more on the EQ issues connected to remote work. That leads then into to another statement you've made is, is that charismatic leaders are not required in remote first organizations. And in fact, charisma is one of the biggest barriers to business growth. Uh, explain that to me because a lot again for for many people who have traditional approaches to this, they always think as leaders requiring a degree of charisma. Dave, I know that you're a charismatic guy. Um, you wouldn't be running a website like this in an organization like this if you weren't. However, the vast majority of remote pioneers are not very charismatic. Uh, think about, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. Think about uh, Elon Musk. These are not the most engaging individuals on the face of the planet. And when you go into an on-premise meeting, meaning a meeting that's in the real world, if I were to actually look inside of a boardroom and I couldn't hear anybody, I would be able to tell you generally whose ideas get adopted. It's the white guy that's six foot two that looks like Captain America. That's generally the guy that has his ideas adopted the vast majority of the time. Why? Because he's very charismatic. He looks the right way. He talks the right way. But are his ideas any better than anyone else's? On average, probably not. And probably, actually, his ideas are less effective than other people. But someone like me, the wallflower that's sitting on the side of the office that says, man, I should really just be kind of doing my work instead of listening to this guy blab on about whatever. Uh, I don't have the tool set to be able to discuss my idea and fight for my idea in the same charismatic way that he does. So remote work, and more specifically, asynchronous work, provides for the elimination of charisma from that communication, and then more good ideas make it through the barriers, make it through the crucible inside of those organizations, as opposed to on-premise organizations where that charismatic leader really just kind of takes over the conversation and forget about whether his ideas are good or not. It's just the one that we're going to adopt. Got it. That makes sense to me. So I'm going to... Gonna push on another one that I keep hearing about in all of this discussion in the marketplace, and this is the wording of hybrid work. Now, I'm going to lay out a premise that I've put out on the show, and I want you to kind of react to it and give me your thinking on this premise. And I've been saying that hybrid work defined as three days and you know, in the office and two days out misses the point. And the real idea of hybrid work is about employee, em, empowering employees to make decisions about what's appropriate and then be effective. What's your take on that premise? I think you hit the nail on the head, Dave. Okay. <laughs> uh, so here's the issue with, with hybrid work. And, and I'm going to get on my soapbox here, although I've been on my soapbox the entire time during this uh, our exchange. Hybrid work, I think, is probably the worst option out of the three for a lot of companies that are going, that were remote and are now going to hybrid. It might be a better fit for them to go all the way back to on premise, to an in office environment. And I'll tell you why. It really focuses on a single issue, which 
we're calling distance bias inside of the remote first community. So it's a phenomenon that the closer you are to a decision maker or to a manager, the more your ideas get adopted. So let's go back to the same boardroom again. We have three people on Skype and we have five people in person. We say, hey, we're going to do A. It's a one hour meeting. We all decide that we're going to do A. And then those three people pop off of Zoom <clears throat> and those five people are left in the boardroom. Unfortunately, what happens in that boardroom right afterwards is what I like to call a undocumented conversation. Inside of asynchronous teams, there are no undocumented conversations because everything is recorded. Everything is documented. And I turn to you, Dave, and I say, Jim is an idiot. You know that Jim doesn't want to do it. We should not do A. We should be doing B. I think that we should be doing B. Dave, what do you think? And then Dave says, hmm, yeah, maybe we should do B. And then the next morning, Jim wakes up to his email. He thought that he was doing A and all of a sudden we're doing B and he feels completely disempowered. He's a second class worker now inside of the organization. He either has to move into the office, which he doesn't want to do to be closer to Dave, or he just ends up quitting and he finds another company that ends up uh, being able to work with him completely remotely. So evening the playing field, the solution to that, by the way, is to implement asynchronous management inside of the office and outside of the office. But it's a very, very difficult ch ch chasm to cross because we've got a lot of these workers that just kind of flow back into the face-to-face -face communication that really slows down people's flow state, access to deep work, and also creates a lot more of those undocumented conversations that really end up destroying the remote workers that are inside of your organization. And it's funny because you've hit on exactly the area that I think is now interesting is these requirements to make remote first work effective, to make true asynchronous work effective. So if you had to boil down what you thought the requirements for a true remote first business to be successful, what would that list be? So first one would be democratized processes. So everyone inside of the organization must be able to write down what they do inside of their job. You must remove sacred knowledge from the organization. So we have an internal saying, which is you don't currently inhabit a position or you, you are not the position. You currently inhabit the position. You are an operator of that position. So I'm not the CMO of the company. I currently inhabit the position of CMO of the company. But if I wanted to, as an example, write a book over the year and a half, um, and I needed to delegate those responsibilities quickly and easily, all the processes and systems are in place in order to be able to do that. So that's the first one. The second one is really making sure that everyone has that philosophy of radical transparency inside of the organization. So the documentation <clears throat> of those conversations and the dictation of all of those conversations. So there's no secret communications. There's no undocumented forms of interaction is also really critical in order to be able to run an asynchronous organization. And then I think probably the third one is making sure that you actually don't fall back into destroying the work that you did on your first and second um, tenant. So making sure that when you Go back to a hybrid work environment as an example. You are not just paying attention to someone's decision or paying attention to someone's input because they're closest to you. Uh, that is not going to actually make you successful. You need to be able to actually come up with really actionable reasons as to why you're choosing A versus B and not just because they were the closest person to you. There's an interesting um, study that I've currently started running for Asana. Um, in collaboration with them <clears throat> to be able to figure out whose ideas get adopted quickly inside of Asana project management systems. And then we try to correlate that back to, are they in the same office? Like, are they in the same physical space or are they working remotely? And there seems to be a really interesting correlation, which is the closer you are to that person, 
the more that those people end up adopting each other's ideas, uh, which has nothing to do with the quality of the idea whatsoever. It's just that they're close to each other. And that's super interesting to think about that that is one of those hidden factors that people may not be thinking about. Now, most of the people that I, that I talk to and engage with are the technology end of this. You, you think about the, the people that you've referred to, the kind of the pandemic, uh, you know, started remote people, these people that have been thrown into it. Most of the time, it's their technology provider that did a good job getting them alive, that got them to that point. And so these are the people oftentimes that these business leaders look to to make the technology effective, to make it work for them, right? If, you're, if you've gone from one model to the next, you've generally done it by the use of technology right now. And so what advice would you give to these technology providers who are saying, look, we're really good at the technology. I wanna get really good at helping these companies use these technologies to become asynchronous or remote first. What advice would you give them for getting rolling on, on delivering that promise? So from a technological perspective, I think, and this is a bit of an uncomfortable response, I think I would give, but unfortunately, the technology is actually the smallest part of this entire interaction. People ask me all the time, Slack or Microsoft Teams, Zoom or Google Meet? And I respond saying, if those are the questions that you think you should be asking me, you don't actually know the answers that you're looking for. And so what you really need to actually do before any of that technology is laid out is understand the way in which you should interact with other team members inside of your organization and the way that information should be disseminated inside of that organization. So once you've built that theoretical framework, which I've laid out in the book, the Running Remote book, uh, and a bunch of other places, that's the core piece that you need to be able to implement before you add on the technology. Now, if you've already added on the technology and you're already there and you're in eight hour Zoom calls, uh, one of the biggest action points that I can suggest that people would do is uh, if you're inside of an org right now, have everyone write down, it's a five page document, how to do my job. So it's just a simple document, how to do Liam's job. And you can link out to other sources, but you, and it's only five pages, meaning it can't be 15, it can't be 20 pages, it has to be concise. And then you take that document, you put it on a database. So we use a tool called Trainual for process documentation. You can use like GitLab, you can use Google Docs, whatever you want. And then at least you've got a framework in place so that there's no more sacred knowledge that's disappearing <clears throat> from the organization. And once you have those pieces in place, then you can start to automate all of those processes, all of those things that people do in their job. I'm blown away when we run through this exercise with clients, uh, we'll end up seeing, wow, half the stuff that they do is moving one cell in a spreadsheet to another cell in a spreadsheet. And I could just build <laughs> a very simple piece of software or code to effectively make their jobs redundant so that they can work on deeper and more important problems inside of the company. And it's interesting because you literally just said, and when we work with clients to do this, I will observe to those technology listener you know, providers that are listening, that's consulting. That's exactly the kinds of services that I've been talking about on the show, saying you can get into doing this because you're not only the technology implementer, but if you move into the business process side of this, you are even more valuable. <laughs> so, Oh, absolutely. And I think that that's a big piece that not many people really recognize is I know a lot of these people that don't necessarily have the the service-based technology part that you're talking to, that you're speaking to, if you had a full solution like that, I mean, there aren't many people in the industry that exist in that can like, are kind of like a double threat, but if you could be, man, that would be fantastic because the technology people don't really know the service side and the service side people don't really know the technology. Well, Liam, we've made the case there. So that's a perfect place to end. If people wanted to learn more and, and, and start researching this, you know, what, what are you offering out to the, to the market to help them get started? So if you go to runningremote.com slash book, you're actually going to get a couple examples of the how to do my job document. So if you just want to go through that first step, you can go and get those. Um, and you can obviously check out the book as well. If you're interested in the conference, go to runningremote.com. 
And if you can't afford the book or the conference, go to youtube.com slash running remote. We put up all of our talks for free. I think it's probably the biggest database of remote first founder talks um, that I know of. So go check that out and uh, spend the next six or seven hours kind of grinding through all that content. Thanks for your time and attention. Time is a finite resource, and I really value you giving me some of yours. If you like this video, you can let me know with a like of the video, and even more valuable, hitting the subscription button. My content is all free, and I use metrics like subscriptions to pay the bills, so it has real value. The content here is produced under ethics guidelines, posted at businessof.tech. If you're interested in more content like this, you can get access to content early via our Patreon at patreon.com slash MSP radio. It's our give what you want model where you set the value of what you think the content is worth. If you like this podcast, you can catch it daily as the five minute news and commentary show, The Business of Tech, available on all your favorite podcatchers with links at businessof.tech. Just hit that big blue button to subscribe. Again, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen, and I really value the interaction. If you want to say something in the comments, I do respond and watch all that, and I look forward to talking to you next time. Thank <laughs> you.